We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. The United States Declaration of Independence, 1776. We are now about to take our leave and kind farewell to our native land, the country the Great Spirit gave our fathers. We are on the eve of leaving that country that gave us birth. It is with sorrow we are forced by the white man to quit the scenes of our childhood. We bid farewell to it and all we hold dear. Charles Hooks, Cherokee Vice Chief, speaking of the Trail of Tears on November 4, 1838. Who would have known a mere 50 years after the United States declared their own independence and right to happiness and prosperity that they would snatch it away from another group of people? The Native Americans might have guessed that after centuries of what could be referred to as the American Holocaust, genocide against the Native Americans for hundreds of years. Since Christopher Columbus first came to the Americas, Native American death tolls have racked up to estimates of 10 million to 114 million. For comparison, 6 to 11 million were killed in the Nazi Holocaust. After disease wiped out the majority of the natives, many were murdered. It seems as if America might be the expert at genocide, and may have even inspired Adolf Hitler, who admired and often praised to his inner circle the efficiency of America's extermination by starvation and uneven combat. Even the Nazi tactic of concentrating undesirables prior to their forced relocation or reduction was drawn from actual U.S. examples, including internment of the Cherokee and other civilized tribes during the 1830s before the devastatingly lethal Trail of Tears was forced upon them. Soon, Manifest Destiny, or the inevitable expansion west, took shape as more white settlers arrived and the slave trade kicked into high gear. Settlers pushed into Dahlonega, Georgia for a gold rush. The remaining natives became an even larger obstacle, and the whites wanted their land and resources. With the Louisiana Purchase in 1803, relocation was becoming the much more convenient option to the United States government. Many felt the Indians were uncivilized. However, by the 1820s, the Cherokee already had a written constitution, schools, and even a newspaper. Much of the whites' European culture had diffused to the Cherokee over the years. Many Cherokee gave up their traditional villages and clothing and built log cabins for their families and wore the European-style clothing instead. Some even converted to Christianity. Their land was still communally owned, but they transitioned from their traditional horticulture to agriculture with small plantations and farms ranging in 2 to 10 acres. For all intents and purposes, they were civilized, but they were allegiant to the Cherokee Nation. They were still different, and this scared the white immigrants. Many wanted the Indians to assimilate, while others thought it might be best for them to move west of the Mississippi River. President Andrew Jackson sought to transform America. Prior to being elected in 1829, President Jackson frequently worked treaties with the Native Americans to push them out of their lands. Some of these treaties were on good terms, while others weren't so much. Change quickly arrived with the passing of the Indian Removal Act of 1830. This act would force the eviction of all Indian groups east of the Mississippi. Many Americans did not like the act. A few spoke up against the controversial act, including Congressman Davy Crockett of Tennessee, saying, I would sooner be honestly damned than hypocritically immortalized. Supporting the Cherokee ruined his political career. The Cherokee believed they had a right to the land, especially since they were there first. Their ancestors had also lived there generations before them. They chose to fight the removal laws in court. In the case Cherokee Nation versus Georgia, the courts refused to even hear the case because of the belief that Georgia's laws did not extend to the Cherokee because they weren't considered a sovereign nation. The Cherokee did not give up. They brought their case to the Supreme Court in 1832, and in the case Worcester versus Georgia, Chief Justice John Marshall ruled that the Cherokee Nation was sovereign so the forced removal was unlawful. In order for the Cherokee to be removed, an agreement by treaty was necessary, which would then need to be ratified by the Senate. After the court's ruling, President Jackson said, John Marshall has made his decision. Now let him enforce it. Build a fire under them. When it gets hot enough, they'll go. 
At this point in time, the Cherokee Nation was not completely united. The large majority were of the National Party, and they followed their principal chief, John Ross, otherwise known as Little White Bird. John Ross was only one-eighth Cherokee and served as adjutant of the Cherokee Regiment in the War of 1812, ironically under Andrew Jackson's command. About 500 out of the 17,000 Cherokee in northern Georgia supported another group of men. Major Ridge, his son, and Elias Boudinot, who were advocates of the removal. These three men, along with members of the Treaty Party, signed the Treaty of New Echota in 1835. After signing the treaty, Major Ridge said, I have signed my death warrant. The signed treaty gave Andrew Jackson the only document necessary for the removal of all of the Cherokee on the communally owned land. All that needed to happen now is the Senate needed to ratify the treaty, which it did by a difference of only one vote. The removal to Oklahoma started in 1838. The United States Army were to march the Cherokee West. Initially, General John Wool was ordered to move the Cherokee, but he resigned in protest, which also delayed the removal process. General Winfield Scott was his replacement. He came to New Echota in May of 1838 with 7,000 soldiers. Because of very poor planning on the government's part, many Cherokee died on the first few trips west. Men, women, and children gathered their few belongings and were herded like animals a thousand miles by foot in very poor conditions. The military guiding them were indifferent to their suffering for the most part. Cherokee Principal Chief John Ross wanted to lead his group on his own, and General Scott allowed him to do so. As a result, even during the harsh winter, there were less casualties. Estimates suggest 4,000 Cherokee died on this trek west that would come to be known as the Trail of Tears. Legend says that mothers wept for their children as they walked the trail. Many were dying, and the elders knew that the children needed their mothers to be strong. They prayed for a sign to bring hope to the women and help with the morale of the group. It is said that wherever the mother's tears fell, the Cherokee Rose grew. The Cherokee Rose is white with gold in the center, representing the white man and his greed for the gold in their rivers, and has seven green leaves to represent the seven clans of the Cherokee. When the women saw these flowers, it gave them hope and strength to go on. The Cherokee Rose is the national flower of Georgia today. The Cherokees settled in Taliqua, Oklahoma. Major Ridge, his son, and Elias Boudinot were murdered by the Cherokee. Many people in our country are unaware of the terrors endured by the natives of this land. It is a dark day in our nation's history. Are all men created equally with certain unalienable rights, or are those rights only for a select few? The Indian Removal Act of 1830 is an example of ethnocentrism so deep that it caused an ethnic cleansing. Should our country continue down the same path in denial, or should we take this as a learning experience and hopefully learn to accept others that are different from ourselves? Maybe they have different colored skin, Maybe they worship a different god. Maybe their political ideologies are different. Maybe they have a different sexual orientation. Maybe they don't speak English. Maybe none of that should matter.